Hi everyone, this video is going to go through the variety of dental instruments that you will need to know for your DEMA 1340 class. We're going to start out here with the basic setup with examination instruments. So for this class, what you'll have to do is you have to be able to recognize the instrument by name and give the use of the instrument. You should also know what category the instrument belongs to. So the category we're working with right here is examination instruments. First instrument is the mouth mirror. The mouth mirror is used intraorally and it has a variety of uses. There's three uses that you need to memorize for the mouth mirror. The mouth mirror is used for indirect vision. It's also used to retract or protect soft tissue. And the third use is for illumination. It helps to illuminate the oral cavity. The next instrument is the Explorer. The Explorer has a sharp point on it, so it's a pointed instrument. The purpose of the Explorer is to examine the teeth for any irregularities. The doctor and hygienist are using the Explorer to look for cracks, cavities, or any other irregularity that may be on the surface, maybe a overhang on a filling or cement that wasn't cleaned up after a crown was placed or excess bonding. So these work by tactile sensation. The doctor and hygienist will run, and you, the assistant sometimes will be using this, by running the instrument across the surface and you're going to feel the point catch on any irregular surfaces, any divots or cracks or raised areas, you'll feel the tip catch on those surfaces. Explorers are typically double-ended. So this is a common style. We have a jaquette end. You don't have to memorize the names of these, but we have a jaquette end and a shepherd's hook end. So explorers come in a variety of shapes and it's up to the operator as to what style they like to use. Next up is the cotton pliers. This is a non-locking cotton plier. Some cotton pliers you can close and they will stay closed. This one does not do that. As soon as you relax your grip, the beaks open up. So if you look at the cotton pliers, notice the tips are serrated so it can grip onto objects a little more easily. And the purpose of your cotton pliers is to transfer objects, small objects, in and out of the mouth. It's hard to grip objects and use your fingers because a lot of what we use is so small. So cotton pliers are great for transferring small items, cotton pellets, wedges, matrix, in and out of the mouth. These first three items, mirror, explorer, cotton pliers, make up the basic setup. These will be set out on every single tray that you put together. The other examination instruments that are put out on occasion for new patients or for exams are periodontal probes or an X-Pro. The periodontal probes that we have here, we have two different probes. One's plastic, the other one is metal, of course. If you notice, they both have these stripes on them. The periodontal probes, the tips are blunt. They are not sharp like the Explorer. So the tips are blunt. The purpose of this instrument is to measure the sulcus. 
So these tips have to go into the sulcus. We don't want the tips sharp, otherwise they could pierce or puncture through the soft tissue. So it's going to be operator preference whether or not they want to use the metal versus the plastic. They could be colorized. Green would mean the sulcus is at a healthy level versus the red would be unhealthy. And the transition, the, the white transition would be a, a poor number. So periodontal probes are used to measure the sulcus depth. Healthy sulcus depths are three millimeters or less. The last instrument on this tray is a combination instrument. This is called an X-Pro. So it's a combination of two instruments, the Explorer, that's where you get the X, from the explorer end and pro from the probe end. So this instrument is a combination explorer probe. So its purpose, its function is the combination of both of those instruments to explore for irregularities and to measure the sulcus depth. So instead of having two separate instruments on a tray, you could have just one. And again, that is operator preference. So those are your examination instruments. For the hand cutting instruments, we have a, a variety here, and these are some of the hardest ones to memorize due to the, the small, na the nature of the small working ends, and they tend to all look very similar. First up is the spoon excavator. Spoon excavators are used to scoop out or remove soft debris. When we take a close look at this instrument, look at the working end. We have what looks like a spoon, a little scooped out spoon. In this, both ends are the same. And the operator will use this to scoop out soft debris. These are quite sharp. I know they're rounded, but the edges are sharp. And I have two here. I just want to show you two different spoon excavators for a comparison of size. So I don't have the black excavator, just these traditional spoon excavators, but they do come in a variety of sizes. So we have a small one on the left and oh, about a medium to medium large size in the middle. So those are your spoon excavators used to scoop out or remove soft debris. Next in line is the enamel hatchet. The enamel hatchet, to me and to most students, looks like a very small wood hatchet that's used to chop wood. So the cutting edge of this, if you can see the blade right here at the edge. So that's the blade. When you look at the handle, when we're talking about GV Black's instrument numbers, let me get this in focus. It may not come through well on the camera, but this number is 15, 8, and 14. There, now you can kind of see it. There's the 14 the 8 and the 15. So remember that refers to the width of the blade, the length of the blade, and the relationship to the handle. So the purpose of the enamel hatchet 
is to break away weakened enamel. It helps to create the walls of the preparation. So this hatchet helps to prepare the tooth. We can keep it that simple. Prepares the tooth. Next up is the Weedlestat chisel. So the Weedlestat is unique. When we go from the handle to the working end, we have a curve. We have this gentle sloped shank as we get to the blade. So that's what's unique about the Weedlestat is the shape of the shank as it curves. This, nearly all the instruments we have here for demonstration are double-ended. So the Weedlestat is also used to prepare the teeth. This works with a pushing motion. So the doctor will push it against the tooth and it will help remove enamel and dentin, creating smooth walls and floors. The shape of this is great for cavities near the gingiva. So this is your Weedlestat chisel. Next up is a straight chisel. This one happens to be a surgical chisel because I don't have a, a typical traditional hand instrument straight chisel. But if you notice, from the handle, through the shank, to the working end, it's straight. So that's why they call it a straight chisel. Again, chisels are used to prepare the teeth to create smooth walls. So that is your straight chisel used to prepare the tooth. The bine angle chisel is next. When you look at your bine angle chisel, by means two, and you look at the shank, of the instrument. We have one bend here and a second bend right here. So going from the handle to the working end, we have two bends, two angles. Now the bind angle chisel is still a three numbered instrument because when you look at the cutting edge, the cutting edge is perpendicular to the handle. So this is still a three number instrument. This one you can see a little easier. It's printed on instead of being engraved. So the numbers for this instrument, the spine angle chisel, are 18, 10, and 16. You don't have to memorize these numbers. I'm just showing you where to find these numbers, these GV Black instrument numbers. So bind angle chisel, two bends in the shank before we get to the working end. The next item, which is also a chisel, is the angle former. When you look at the angle former, spin it this way, look at the cutting edge. See how the cutting edge is not perpendicular to the handle. It slants downward. It's lower on the left and it goes upward on the right side of the working end. So for GV Black's instrument numbers, you should expect four numbers because of the angle of the cutting edge. And if you see here on the numbers, We've got 12, 80, 5, and 8. Again, you don't have to memorize the numbers. I'm just showing you where to find them on the instrument. So the angle former does what its name implies. It creates angles in the preparation. So it creates sharp angles. We don't just want a perfect box shape for preparations. We want undercuts. We want almost a trapezoid-like shape to it. Next hand cutting instrument is the enamel hoe. This one will look very similar to the angle former. 
and I'll put them together for comparison. But when you hold this instrument up and you look closely at it, if you notice the top edge of the cutting edge, that is perpendicular to the handle. So you would expect a three number system here. And we have 10, four and eight for our number. So this is a three number system again, because the working end is perpendicular to the handle. So this is an enamel hoe. This one works with a pulling action. So the doctor would place the working end against the tooth and pull. So the enamel hoe prepares the walls and floor of the preparation. Comparison side by side, let's scramble them up. And based on just the working end, not looking at numbers, just comparing the cutting edges. Can we see if one has a slant to it? The one with the slant is your angle former. So this one here on the right side is your angle former. The one on the left is your enamel hole. So we can double check this by looking at the numbers on the handle. So the one with four numbers is your angle former. The one with three numbers is your enamel hoe. So these are two that look very similar. But again, concentrating on the working end, look for that angle to the blade and also look at the numbers on the handle. And that should help you out. The last ones on the tray here are gingival margin trimmers. Gingival margin trimmers are also a four number instrument. When you look at the working end, the very tips of these instruments are at an angle to the handle. The unique thing about gingival margin trimmers, when we look at them from this direction, notice the curve to the blade here. So that allows the instrument to wrap around the tooth. These instruments are designed to work on the mesial and distal sides of the teeth. So they help to prepare the teeth on the mesial and distal sides. So these also would have four numbers. Again, these are a little bit harder to see because they're engraved instead of being printed. There are four numbers on your gingival margin trimmers used to prepare the mesial and distal sides of the tooth, right at the gum line, right at the gingival margin. Before I put this tray away, I want to compare the enamel hatchet with the bind angle chisel because these two can be confusing for students or anyone when we're just starting out. Look at the working end here. Notice how one of these instruments faces us, the working end faces directly at us, this cutting edge. The other one, the cutting edge faces off to the side, unless we bend it like this and it's in a vertical position. The instrument on the left is the enamel hatchet. 
I like to think of the enamel hatchet as kind of having a, a twist that points it vertically, which may or may not make sense. Sometimes we kind of have to come up with our own memorization tactics. But the instrument on the left is the enamel hatchet. The instrument on the right is the bind angle chisel. So those two look very similar to, stu uh, to students. So those are your hand cutting instruments that you're responsible for knowing. Now in all honesty, a lot of doctors won't use hardly any of these. All of them will have the spoon excavators but most doctors, they won't have all of these. They might have one. They may always like to uh, clean things up with an angle former. But most offices, most doctors prefer using hand pieces. Instead of cutting the tooth by hand, they'll use a hand piece. The next one are restorative instruments. Got a bunch of these. And again, there's a wide variety of instruments out there. We can't say that these are all that's out there, but these are very common ones that we'll come across. So we're gonna start from left to right. So these are restorative instruments. They act on the restorative material, not the tooth directly. So here we have a very unique instrument. This one should be easily recognizable as your amalgam carrier. It has this unique plunger that's used to push the amalgam out of that cylinder. So we have a hollow cylinder that we pack full of amalgam. When the doctor's ready to deliver it, they will push the plunger and there's a little cylinder rod in there that will push it out. So this is your amalgam carrier. It carries amalgam to the prepared tooth. Next we have our condensers, sometimes called pluggers. So up to you, you can call it a condenser or a plugger. If you notice, they have a cylinder-like shape, solid shape. Two different sizes here, medium and a large, double-ended. Purpose is the same. The size depends on how large of a filling you're doing, how large the surface is. Purpose of your condensers and pluggers are to condense or pack the amalgam in place. Next in the row here are our cleoid discoid carvers. Cleoid discoid carvers carve the occlusal surface of the amalgam. I'm going to flip these both so that the discoid end is showing. So the discoid end is the rounded end. The cleoid end is the pointed end. So I think of it as a claw shape for cleoid and discoid shape looks like a disc. It's rounded. And I have two different ones just so you can see a size difference. So we have on the bottom a small cleoid discoid and on the top we have a large cleoid discoid. Some of these are technically called tanner carvers, but we're going to just memorize them as cleoid discoid. The other carver, so if the cleoid discoid works on the occlusal, we need a carver that can work interproximally. So this is a Hollenbach carver, and it's used to carve the mesial and distal sides of the amalgam. Double-ended, to fit on both the mesial and distal sides. 
it has more of a spear-like appearance to the working end. It's very thin, so it can fit between the teeth. It can fit interproximally. Next we have burnishers. Burnishers are used to polish the amalgam restoration. And we have three different burnishers here. Try to keep them in the frame. The top one is a ball burnisher. So the working end has a ball shape to them. The middle one is a ball football. There's a ball shape on the left and a football shape on the right. And the bottom one is an acorn burnisher where the working end kind of looks like an acorn nut. I'm gonna bring these a little closer. So top is a ball, middle is a ball, bottom is an acorn. And I flip these. You've got ball, football, and acorn. All three of these shapes are fairly common. Now, it might depend on what dental school your doctor went to. My doctor never used an acorn burnisher. He was trained at Marquette in Wisconsin. All the graduates from the Georgia School of Dentistry, I see them use acorn burnishers a lot. So that's gonna fall on operator preference. But all burnishers, no matter what the shape is, are used to smooth the amalgam. Once the amalgam hardens, there may be some overhang. So if the mesial, mesial and distal sides are not smooth and the doctor needs to scrape away any excess, they would use this instrument. This instrument is called an amalgam knife. It's very sharp. It's going to be used against that hardened amalgam. It's going to be used to break that off, any overhang. So that's your amalgam knife. Next in the restorative lineup is a Woodson. When you look at the Woodson, it's a double-ended instrument and the ends have different shapes. This end here looks like a condensing end. The other end has a paddle shape. So the Woodson based on its shape is really great for placing restorative material into the tooth, specifically temporary material. IRM, Intermediate Restorative Material. So Woodson's are used to place material into the preparation. Some doctors will even use it to place composite, but we do have specific composite placing instruments right here. Composite placing instruments should be made out of a special material. They should either be titanium coated or coated with anodized aluminum or made out of plastic. We don't really want a plain stainless steel instrument because that could lead to discoloration or scratching of the material. So here we have two titanium coated composite placing instruments. And as the name suggests, they place composite. So I have two unique shapes. And again, this is based on operator preference and of course, what tooth they're working on. My doctor would always use a paddle-shaped composite placing instrument when we're working on anterior teeth, when you're working on large flat surfaces like facial or lingual. If we're working on occlusal surfaces, he would prefer the condensing style and to pack the filling into the deeper preparations. This other instrument, if you notice, has a condensing end, but on one of the bends of the shank, we have a burnishing end. 
So composites don't get burnished like amalgam. They stay soft until we light cure them. But you could place this burnishing end into that soft putty-like composite and make an indentation, make a fossa or a groove with that. So all these instrument designs are fairly unique, but they all serve a purpose. So those are composite placing instruments. Last one for the restorative setup is called a dical placing instrument. This instrument is very small. It's short compared to the other instruments. It's only single sided or single ended. It has this tiny ball at the tip of it. This die cal placing instrument is used to mix and place die cal, which is a type of liner. You could also call it a calcium hydroxide placing instrument. That's the name of the chemical. Die cal is a brand name. So this is your die cal placing instrument or calcium hydroxide placing instrument used to mix and place calcium hydroxide or die cal. The last tray that we have the last tray that we have has accessory items. So accessory items may or may not be needed during the procedure, depending on the procedure, and you would know ahead of time. You know, if you're doing an amalgam, you would use the amalgam well. If you're removing sutures, you'd have a suture knife. So accessories are added as needed. So for our accessories, we have articulating paper and an articulating paper holder. This comes apart. You squeeze the handle, the beaks open up, and you can remove the paper. This is marking paper or carbon paper. If you rub the paper, it leaves a mark. You can't quite get a good mark. Plus my gloves would be the same color <laughs> as the paper. But when a patient has a filling, an occlusal filling. We want to make sure that the filling is not too high. This acts like carbon paper. The patient bites on the paper and it will leave blue spots on their teeth. If we get a lot of heavy blue spots on the occlusal surface of the filling, the doctor would trim it down. So articulating paper and your articulating paper forceps or holder, they work together. Now, in my office, my doctor didn't want to spend, you know, $20 per instrument for the holder, so we just used our fingers and held the paper in the mouth with our fingers. If you do that, you just have to be careful not to get bit by your patients. Next, we have an amalgam well right here, this silver bowl. Your amalgam well is used to hold amalgam after it's been mixed. So we place the amalgam in the well and then we would take our carrier and scoop it up. So if you had amalgam in the well here, you would take your carrier and you would scoop and press until you fill up your carrier. So your amalgam well simply holds your mixed amalgam. Then we have a dappen dish. Dappen dishes hold liquids or powders, any small amount of material. Don't memorize them based on color. They could come in any color, clear, blue, green, red. Dappen dishes are used to hold small amounts of material, liquids or powders. Then we have spatulas. I have two different spatulas here. Again, you'd pick the size based on what you're mixing. Now there are much larger spatulas that are used to mix stone and impression materials. But these two spatulas are specific to mixing things like cement, temporary filling materials. So whenever you have a spatula, they're going to be used to mix dental materials. These are specifically cement spatulas.
Here we have a Howe pliers, also called a 110. If you notice inside the handle, it has the indentation, the imprint of 110. So you can call this a 110 pliers or a Howe pliers. Howe pliers are used to grasp small items. They're used to bend wires and clasps. So orthodontic wire or clasps on retainers or to just grab a hold of something that's hard to pull out of the mouth, like a wedge that might be stuck between the teeth. So this is your how pliers. Napkin chain. Now in class, we're going to use disposable napkin chains, but some offices still use these reusable silicone ones. They work with an alligator style clip and your napkin chain is used to hold the patient's napkin in place. The disposable ones we use have sticky tabs. Instead of a clip, they'll have a sticky that you attach to the patient napkin. This right here is one style of matrix system. A matrix system, what you see here with this loop. This loop sits around the tooth and creates a temporary wall. So when the tooth is prepared, if we have a mesial or a distal preparation, there's no wall there. The doctor removed the wall because they had decay. So we put a temporary wall around the tooth. Then we can put the filling in because the wall will help hold it in place. And once the material is set, we can then remove this temporary wall. So matrix systems create a temporary wall to help support the restoration. And this is just one style. We'll have a chapter on matrix systems and we'll learn three different styles of matrix systems. The last items on your accessory list to memorize are your three different scissors. We have a surgical scissors, a suture scissors, and a crown and bridge, sometimes called a crown and collar scissors. The crown and bridge scissors, if you look at how thick the beak is, the cutting area, this scissors is used to cut temporary material. So temporary acrylic. The suture scissors is used to cut suture material or stitches. And the tissue scissors is used to cut soft tissue, used to cut gingiva. Looking at them a little closer, the tissue scissors has more narrow beaks and the cutting edges are straight. With your suture scissors, the tip is blunt so we don't risk poking the patient. And when you open up the scissors, the cutting edge, one of them has a notch in it. And that notch helps to hold the suture in place. So when you close the scissors together, the suture stays in that notch and doesn't just slip out. So this unique shape belongs to the suture scissors. And the last one for an up close, look at it. This is your crown and bridge scissors. Much thicker, stronger beaks. So it can be used to cut that thick temporary acrylic material. It can also be used to cut orthodontic items. It can be used sometimes on stainless steel crowns because of that strong, thick beak on the scissors. 
So that finishes up your accessory items. So for your instrument test, you'll see an instrument and you'll get a question. It'll ask, name this instrument, and you'll have to write out the name. Or it might ask, what is the use of this instrument? And you'd write out what it's used for. You may also get a question that asks you to pick out which instrument is the hand cutting instrument. You'll get three or four different instruments. You'll have to pick out the appropriate instrument that belongs to that category. So that finishes up the instruments that you need to know for your instrument ID test. If you have any questions, send me an email. Thank you for watching.